session will start with will be a, a co-presentation by Mario Fezakas and Antonio Poe from Brent Fountain. Um, they are fraud uh, forensics experts. Mario, the floor is yours. I will allow you to introduce yourself. Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Antonio Poe. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague, uh, Mario Fazikas. We are both, um, we'll be sharing this session um, entitled Anti-Fraud Playbook. Uh, it's, it's really not just a topic that we've thumb sucked, but it's based out of a book, an actual playbook around um, the COSO framework. And that's what we want to discuss with you today. Just by way of quick introduction, uh, I'm responsible for the forensics division within SNG Grand Thornton in South Africa. Uh, I've spent the last 18 years operating in, in the forensic investigation space uh, across the continent in the Middle East, Europe, and in North America. Um, my colleague, Mario, um, also shares a similar work history with myself, having spent over 20 years in fraud risk management. In fact, we met many years ago um, when we were working at Ernst & Young um, and, and over the years have continued to maintain our relations. And today we, we, we work together again um, at Grant Thornton uh, uh, where Mario specializes specifically in, in, in the fraud risk management space. We are both certified fraud examiners and, and are passionate not only about the, the technical side of what we do, um, but also sharing our knowledge with industry at large. Um, if I may, Chair, confirm that my screen is coming through and that I'm audible before I get into the meat of our presentation. Yes, you are, but you keep losing connection a little bit or you keep breaking a bit. All right, I'll switch network if that continues. I'll monitor the text. Thank you. So if we look at what we want to achieve today, we really want to take you into the playbook and talk about the five principles which we extract out of, uh, out of COSO, out of the framework itself. Uh, what we then do with each of those principles is that we, we've developed plays, as we call them. Think of a chess game. Um, you know, a really seasoned player will have strategies uh, or plays where they can take out their opponent in three moves. Uh, five moves, nine moves. Uh, those of you exposed to chess will know that there are these strategic moves that you can play. But these moves are not independent of each other. Uh, in that, yes, you can play your three move uh, game, but also if you realize that the opponent introduces something that prevents you from completing your, your three move game, you then move over to the strategy of playing a five move game. And so think of these plays that way, is that it, it builds, one builds on top of the other. And then lastly, what we hope to achieve is to give you some tools, to share with you some tools so that um, at the end of our session, you can actually go out back into the workplace and, and, um, and, and practice or put into practice what we've discussed today. So we'll cover the introduction. I'll introduce you to the, the phases and the plays and, and Mario will come in and then we'll do a QA and a in the end. Let's look at how we got here, right? This takes us back to 92. Uh, back then, uh, the Committee of Sponsoring Organization, or COSO as we commonly call it, was concerned with standardizing and giving us uh, this framework, this integrated uh, um, framework around internal controls. It, it was really a loose framework, if you will, uh, and, and it, it needed some kind of development as the years progressed. And so what it took us to in, in, the, in 2013 is a little bit more definition into what this framework is all about to help us put it into practice. So we saw the introduction of 17 principles, one of which spoke to fraud specifically. Now, when I was listening to uh, James uh, uh, Retinaro, he, he mentioned a very important thing in his concluding, conclusion, talking about whether or not internal auditors are also uh, quote unquote forensic investigators. And, and when you look at this framework, it, it seeks to almost create a separation of role in, in regards to how do we deal with forensics uh, in that it calls for specialists. 
That became very clear in 2016 when the ACFE, or the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, partnered with COSO in building on this principle of fraud risk and, and basically saying, how do we take this into the organization and how does one implement a fraud risk management guide? And that's what the 2016 uh, uh, collaboration between the ACFE and, and COSO gave us. Now, this guide, of course, had its own limitations in that, you know, if, if you were not a specialist, a CFE, an investigator, you needed a little bit more uh, reading and research and, and, and exercise or practice, if you will, to make sense of it. And so in 2020, Grant Thornton partnered with the ACFE, or the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and we published this anti-fraud playbook. Uh, and this is why I say our topic today is not just a topic, it's actually based on our anti-fraud playbook. And the plays we want to discuss with you come out of this book, and, and we'll make these resources available. Um, the purpose of, of my introduction with this slide is to say to you, here's the journey, so that when you read the playbook, you, you can actually reference it back and see how it ties back to COSO and how critical it is that as part of our integrated framework around internal controls, we need to be looking at these fraud-related or anti-fraud measures, um, if you will. We come now to 2016, and, and we talk to the issue of speciality in that, yes, the guideline that we produced or that the ACFE and COSO produced was great, but it, it, it's that element of specialization that, that was required, which somewhat complicated it for others. But what I love about this play around the 2016 guide is that it, it really gave us an idea around how do we build this anti-fraud culture? Um, how do we make this a formal process? And what are those necessary steps to be able to execute on fraud risk management? So we go to the COSO framework and we extract in our session today, five principles. The first principle that, that, that we wanna talk about is really around the governance structures, uh, fraud risk governance, as we call it. So with fraud risk governance, what we're saying, or what COSO is saying here is, you need to have a structure within your organization to manage fraud. So uh, there'll be a fraud risk committee in some organizations uh, and, and other subcommittees that, that are specifically geared towards this, um, the execution of this fraud risk management program. Once the governance structure is in place, we then move over to the, the FRA or the fraud risk assessment. And this is where it gets interesting in that Many organizations look at fraud risk assessment and interpret COSO or apply the principle of fraud risk assessment differently. Others take a very basic way in, in how they do a fraud risk assessment. And, and I've also seen and worked with organizations that are really detailed and take a very complex approach to building uh, or implementing a fraud risk assessment. The essence of it is that you need to understand what targets are there for the organizations and what channels um, are there or avenue for fraud to be committed so that you can build your defenses. The third principle is around the control activity. Now, here we're talking about two types of controls. Yes, it's fraud controls, but we want, or rather we, we, we are concerned with preventative controls, including those are th that are detective in nature because we don't really want to sit on one side of the fence and only prevent. And when something happens, we are not able to take corrective measures. So we want to be able to, to detect and once detected, move over to the next step, which is fraud investigation and corrective action. I think what's also worth noting with the previous principle, fraud control activity, is that when we look at the controls, these controls can either be, or, or should be looking at internal and external threats. Coming to the investigative part, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, controls aren't, you know, they're good, they're necessary, but they don't always work. Uh, I think if, if these controls always worked and they guaranteed zero fraud, some of us would be without jobs. Um, uh, so, so we need these controls and, and we need to acknowledge that sometimes they fail and, and because people are creative uh, or because we're sleeping at the wheel and we're not updating our controls and we're not testing them and we're not doing fraud risk assessments. But when they do fail, we need to have the ability to investigate and to take corrective measures. Lastly, 
The fifth principle, which, which we unpack um, and which we will give you two plays on, is around fraud risk management monitoring activities. So we want to be able to monitor and measure um, the success of our program. So is it yielding the desired results? Where do we tweak it? And most importantly, is it still relevant? So you may have had a, a fraud risk management program that you developed three years ago. Obviously, in, in, in light of COVID and the different work situ scenarios we find ourselves in, that may require, in fact, not may, it requires revisiting to make sure that it remains current. So those are the five principles, ladies and gents, that we want to then unpack and, and discuss them in, 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 in two plays. So we've got two plays each, but keep in mind as we go through these plays that these plays are not independent of each other. Uh, you can play them on their own, but uh, you build on them. So they can lead you to uh, a maturity model, if you will, uh, that helps your organization have stronger defenses against fraud. At this stage, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Mario, to take us into the details of these plays, and then we'll meet up again in the end when we go through um, the Q&A session. Over to you, Mario. Thank you, Antonio, and good afternoon, ladies and gents. I'm just getting my screen ready. There we go. Okay, ladies and gents, I just want to make sure you can see the screen and you can hear me. Yes, Mario, we can oh, see, good. we can hear. Great, thank you. So what I'm going to do is take you through um, these five, these 10 plays that are organized into the five phases, starting with fraud risk governance. The, the first step is to understand where are you and where do you want to be? So if you look at this, let me blow it up. It's a maturity model. So the playbook is 60 pages. It's full of information and it, it gives you step-by-step -step definition. So you can have a look here and say, where am I in all of this? Am I on the left, which is ad hoc? And the words sum it up. Ad hoc is undocumented, processes are disorganized, chaotic, or am I initial, repeatable, whatever the case may be. And where do you want to be? You don't have to be on the right-hand side, which is leadership or world-class. Depends who you are. When we deal with a public sector, most public sector are happy to be somewhere around about repeatable and or man they're very happy if they're managed. But an SA Breweries, for example, needs to be on the right-hand side. They are competing globally. And there are dangers as well, just because you may be in leadership. What can happen is you get complacent, you can become arrogant and you sit back and relax and then everything starts falling apart. So there are dangers in each of these areas as well. Play two, we now look at culture, which generally focuses on the tone at the top. So the basics, one of basics of fraud 101 is the fraud triangle, pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. This is how um, the fraudster does what he does. Not the professional fraudster, he doesn't need a reason. This is your situational fraudster. <laughs> the person who you hire today, they are honest, but six months or six years later, they start stealing. And you need to try and balance that fraud triangle with what, what we call the integrity triangle. In many organizations, we find that half the integrity triangle is there. People are responsible for certain functions. They have authority for certain things, but the accountability is missing. Think about it, ladies and gents. Think about your organization. Is there accountability? I'm sure there's the other two. What tends to be missing is that accountability element. That's key. The next step is to think like a fraudster. I think somebody's got their mic on. There's some noises coming through. Thank you. We need to think like a fraudster. We need to be sitting at our workstations and saying, if I wanted to steal, how would I steal? And Tanya mentioned fraud risk assessments. That's how we do them. We say to people, if you wanted to steal from you, how would you do it? Most people can tell us. 
they've worked there long enough to know it. So this is where your fraud risk map comes in, your roadmap, as the, the, the playbook calls it. Okay, it's an American playbook, so don't get confused. The fraud risk map, the, the roadmap is your fraud risk register. That's all it is. So let me give you an example. This is an art exhibition. Those are crowns. People are going to come there, walk through those tables, they call plinths, and look at the crowns. They, they want the exhibition to be vulnerable. That's why you can see there's no security. So all that's ha happened is there's one camera in the top right-hand corner, and there's a door on the left-hand side. And outside the door, there's a security guard. That security guard tells people when they walk in, do not touch the exhibits. That's it, ladies and gents. So now, I, maybe you want to put it in the chat or tell me, what could go wrong here? We now have to think like a fraudster. We have to think what could happen. People are going to walk in and amongst the tables, the ladies would love to pick up the crowns, put it on their head, take a selfie and put it back down. But the God, God says to them, do not touch. So what else could happen? Could people touch the crowns? For sure. Caramele, thank you very much. Yes, now you're thinking. Bribe the God. But the God is outside, remember that. And he doesn't search anybody. What else could happen? Remember, there's more than fraud and theft that can happen here. Anything could happen. Yes. Bakan, yes. Face the other way. Stand with your back to the camera. Um, the crowns could fall down. Pick up the crown, try and Yes, there's so much that could happen, ladies and gents. Well done. That's exactly what could happen. You've covered most of what could happen. They could get damaged, stolen. Um, yeah, damaged. Tuane, thank you. Abia. Swap the crown. Yes. Malebojo, well done. So somebody could come there, photograph the real crown, go away, make a polystyrene crown, bring it there under his jacket or in a bag, stand with his back to the camera. When no one's looking, switch one crown for the other one and walk out. Yes, replica. Manto, thank you. So all that happened was the lady leant against it and the one knocked the other. It's called the domino effect. And 12 crowns got damaged. The manager doesn't know what to do. He's running around with his hands on his head. He doesn't have a disaster recovery plan, a fraud response plan. He doesn't know what to do. The security guard heard the noise, comes in and stands in the door and he just stands there looking. He doesn't know what to do. Nobody's told him what to do. When we think about it, in hindsight, they should have moved the tables further apart. So if one fell, it didn't hit the other one. If there wasn't enough space, they should have at least bolted the plinths down. L brackets, four L brackets, one on each side. So if somebody leans against it, the plinth doesn't fall over. They could put glass covers over the crowns. So if it does fall, the crown only moves a little an inch or two and doesn't fall off and break. They could have drilled two holes in the plinth, put cable ties to hold the crown. So even if it did fall over, it's not going anywhere. There's so much they could have done. We trust people. Oh, ladies and gents, that's what I hear in many organizations when they've had fraud. But we trusted her. She's worked here 33 years. He's worked here 12 years. We, we know him. We socialize with Ladies and gents, that's why we have controls. People change. And that's why fraud is so painful, ladies and gents, because it's normally the person we like, trust, and know. And the crowns weren't insured because, hey, these things happen to other people, not us. Why does the fraud still want our money? He wants our opposition's money, not ours. $200,000 damages. 
US dollars. Okay, so we're still on think like a fraudster. So at a minimum, your fraud risk register should have the unit, name of the business unit, department, the actor, which is the, the person that could do this. It has to, so if somebody wants to steal cash, it needs to be somebody in the finance department or somebody in payroll. There's where the cash is. Where's the fraud risk entry point? But you need to go further than that. We see so many fraud risk registers with so little information. We don't know how it's actually helping the organization. You need to move to the right column and say, what is the fraud category type? What are the related controls? Is it internal, external? So let me give you an example. Here is the fraud tree. There is the link where you can go and have a look at it on the, on the, on the website of the ACFE. Let's blow it up. There are your three categories of occupational fraud. We have corruption, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud. And you'll notice asset misappropriation is by far the biggest. So I want to show you a scenario. Here's an actual fraud that happened here in South Africa. Financial manager stole 32 million rand and then committed suicide, shot herself with her husband's gun. Um, she's accounts payable function. She creates a fictitious vendor. She invoices Eurocopter. She receives the invoice as the financial manager. She approves it and authorizes it, forges her boss's signature and makes payment over a few years. That was her house, by the way. That's in what's called Pekinwood Estates in Hartebeersport Dam, house worth six and a half million rand. So if um, we had a fraud risk register, how, how would we, what would we call this? Asset misappropriation doesn't really tell you how she did it. Okay, so we know the fraud scheme is asset misappropriation. That's the first step. We now need to go down one level. What is the fraud category? Is it cash? Is it inventory? Well, in this case, it's cash. Under cash, there are three options. Theft of cash on hand, bank deposit, petty cash. Is it theft of cash receipts? Is it fraudulent disbursements? Well, in this case, it's fraudulent disbursements. Then under fraudulent disbursements, we have five options. Which one is it? The fraud type is billing scheme, and in particular, shell company. Now we know exactly what we're talking about. We know what our risk is. That is the detail we should go down to. And there's an example which appears in the playbook and giving you, showing you what it would look like. Not very exciting, but it does the job. That tells you exactly. First one is payroll. It's internal. It's asset misappropriation. It could be overpayment, the entry risk is payroll records, and then the last two um, would be expense reimbursements. And you would list all your, your risks. The nice thing about the playbook, ladies and gents, is it's practical. It's got a whole lot of checklists. If you want to implement this, check one, check two, check, 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 all done, good to go. Many of these um, guidelines that we look at are not practical. You know how many people phone us about King 4? They're saying it's King 3 used to be much more practical than King 4 on corporate governance. And they've actually gone a little bit backwards with King 4 because the practical element is missing. We wanted to make this booklet practical. Play 4, fraud risk assessment. Okay, so basically a fraud purpose of a fraud risk assessment is not to find fraud. Believe it or not, data analytics is to find fraud. Fraud risk assessment is to find out where are we most susceptible to fraud? Where are the controls broken? Where are they not working? So it's basically taking the organization and looking under the surface level, turning that iceberg upside down, saying on paper, these are our controls. Let's go and see how well they're working. And the fraud risk assessment is done on an inherent basis. We don't want to know about controls. We come in and we look at all your risks. Management can then respond and say, oh, but I've got this compensating control or that control. Mitigating control, fine. So principle eight of COSA framework says fraud risk assessments are now considered distinct from general risk assessments. Very important, ladies and gents. Often we go to um, organizations and we say to them, have you had any fraud investigations, fraud risk assessments? Yes, and they give us the report. We need to learn as much as we can about the organization and where its hotspots are. So what we tend to do, we take those reports and we start searching through them, maybe a PDF, Word document, and we look for words like financial statement fraud. We look for 
billing schemes. We look for corruption, kickbacks. We can't find those words because many risk managers have not been taught fraud. So the th- the fraud, the, the type of risks they're looking at are your currency fluctuations, your union activities, your weather. Those are the type of things. So we, we take with a pinch of salt when, when companies say to us, yes, we've had a fraud risk assessment. They've had a risk assessment that may not actually cover fraud. So in order to get information, because that's what a fraud risk assessment is, we speak to people. We start normally with surveys, very important surveys. Once we've got surveys from management, we go and interview management. And we can remember, what did he say in the survey versus what is he or she telling me now? And then say, why is this disparity? What did you mean here when you said this? Then we look at workshops. Very important to have have workshops where we have multiple people there to get buy-in. So we'll have risk management there. We'll have internal audit there. We'll have the operational management and say, what do you think? Is this a high risk, medium risk, low risk? And we get consensus. Otherwise, it's, oh, internal audits dictating to us or forensics is telling us what to do. We don't agree with them. Tip, mature risk assessment process should employ multiple techniques. Some people have just had a survey done. Survey gives you limited information, ladies and gents. You need to go, it can work, but we need to go just beyond surveys in most cases. Uh, You could have focus groups, walkthroughs, very important. Management tells you one thing, then you go for a walkthrough. Say to the subordinate, show me how you do your job. And then you start picking up conflicts between what the management told you happens versus what is actually happening. And again, there's key questions. There's your checklists. Who will be on your fraud risk assessment team? Well, it's a collaborative effort. Should be internal audit and management working together. Um, where do you want to start your fraud risk assessment? Where's your um, hotspots? That's where data analytics may come into it. When you analyze your data, it picks up where your controls are broken and you're losing money or there's uh, overpayments, duplicate payments, and so on. And I'm not going to go through all these. You can read them in the book when it gets emailed to you. Um, One important factor is, is it going to be based solely on likelihood and impact? Because that's your traditional red, amber, green. High or low impact, high or low um, likelihood. You can add to that by frequency. Oh, it's, we could only lose 10 Rand, but how frequently could you lose that 10 pullers? On a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, because then it starts adding up all those 10 pullers. And what about the velocity? How quickly could this happen? So those are just some things for you to think about. As part of the risk scoring process, you should identify existing anti-fraud controls and the effectiveness. Stands to reason. What is important, ladies and gents, when we do fraud risk assessments, we give management the report. It's not an exciting report. And often we'll get told, oh, we don't have time this financial year. We look at it next financial year. If you've done data analytics as a separate report, you can then say, no, it's actually very important that you do something now because look at what the data analytics has shown us. You're actually losing money. Go and fix those controls. So often we advise organizations to do fraud risk analysis with data analytics. You know, ladies and gents, as auditors, we tend to tell the client when we're coming. We'll be there next week, Wednesday. We're going to stay for a week. This is what we're going to look at. And this is where we're going to sit and we're going to have this for lunch. No wonder why we don't find fraud. When we're there, everybody's on their best behavior. As soon as we leave and we finish the audit, they start misbehaving. Oh, the auditors are gone. We can relax. That's where continuous controls monitoring comes in. When you're not there, the data is being monitored. And when we do the the fraud risk assessment, it's done on an inherent basis. And your, your data analytics would start with your known patterns, and we would look at things like your master files. Compare your employee master file with your vendor master file. Merge them and look for similarities. There's your conflicts of interest. We then move on up the line and we start looking at the transaction files. And we go right to the end and do even textual analytics. Are people using certain words in their email correspondence? 
that denotes pressure. What are we going to do? What if we get caught? We're under pressure. Let's have a look at those emails. Play six, fraud control activities. This is where training comes into it. And when you do training, it's good to include interactive sessions, role-playing exercises. And in the previous Association of Certified Fraud Examiners um, report to the nations, which you can download for free, and there's the URL, they showed that when organizations implemented anti-fraud initiatives, if they combined it with fraud awareness training, they got much better results than when they did not combine it with fraud awareness training. For example, the hotline. When the hotline was just implemented with no training, 37% of their frauds are discovered through the hotline. When they combine with fraud awareness training, 56% of their tips come from the whistleblowing mechanism. Let me give you now some examples of what we've done with clients um, in terms of awareness and training. Very important to have pre and post workshop questionnaires. Um, we use a survey platform, that's our survey platform of choice, Survey Fiesta. And you know, often management says, what value did we get? Well, what do we have to show after the training? Oh, we've got a attendance register. That's not very exciting, we've got an attendance register. But if we see what do people know before the training versus what do they know after the training, oh, management sees much better results. We got a return on our investment. Then we look at industrial theater. There's three actors that we hired to roll out the Transnet um, turnaround strategy. We do polls, quizzes, critical thinking exercises to keep people engaged. We've got a cartoonist. He draws little cartoons. That is Lofty. We did that character for the South African Reserve Bank. Underneath Lofty is a comic strip. We wanted the anti-fraud and corruption unit at Eskom to stand out. And we looked at the newsletter and the newsletter was full of text. So we said, let's start putting comic characters in. So straight away, it stands out from everything else that's in there. We link policies, hotline code of ethics to each other in the training. So in, the attendees can understand much better how it all fits together. We do infographics. That's a summary of the training. What must I listen for? What must I look for in terms of red flags? People take this away with them. Pin it up, put it in their desk drawer, refer to it later. We use um, videos. We've got videos of whistleblowers, mafia bosses, ex-fraudsters, like Brad Sadler in the bottom right-hand corner. And then, of course, to get buy-in. When we did training for the South African Reserve Bank, now they've got uh, re reserve bank offices in each province. What you'll notice at the bottom is there's Pretoria North, Bloemfontein, Durban, and Port Elizabeth. We got each group to design their own hotline poster. Instead of us designing it and giving it to them, now they there's no buy-in, there's no engagement from them. Now they've created this poster. They're passionate about it. They're going to make sure that poster's up. And they're going to tell all their colleagues about the poster that they created. They're proud of it. This is a client of ours. The hotline calls over an 18-month period. We wondered, how did the, why did the calls go up? We went back to our diaries to see, did we do any anti-fraud initiatives? Yes, ladies and gents, every case we did something. There again, showing the value of fraud awareness, industrial theater, serve ethics surveys. Otherwise, Fraud is out of sight, out of mind. Cinderella, this is what the ladies call because she stayed in the Boxburg suburb of Cinderella. She stole 460 million rand over 13 years. That's what she bought with her 460 million rand. New vehicles, properties. This is a video clip of the asset forfeiture unit in her house. You'll notice the cameraman spent a lot of time on those suitcases. Now, to me, these suitcases are old-fashioned and ugly, but they are Louis Vuitton. They are status symbols. They cost one million rand. 
what's that, about 900,000 puller for four cases, ladies and gents. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in one of our training sessions about five years ago, um, one of the attendees remembered those suitcases and then saw about six, seven months later, a colleague going to Disneyland, posing at OR Tambo Airport, taking photographs of him and his family with those suitcases. This employee remembered the training, reported to the hotline. We were then called in, please come and investigate. I need to find out that this person was colluding, he was in finance, he was colluding with one of the vendors who was allegedly delivering goods, but never actually delivering them, forging goods receive notes, and the finance person was paying him to the tune of 37 million. And they were splitting it 50-50. So they each had about 17 million rand. So he could afford to buy this four sets of luggage. Then we come to investigations and corrective action. Does your organization have investigation protocols for how to communicate, how to capture evidence, document the investigation? So many times that's how people go wrong. The evidence is not correctly captured, documented. And there are many tools that you can use. I mean, Antonio could speak on computer forensics, e-discovery and digital forensics for ages. This is his passion. A lot of people don't know the difference between them. Computer forensics just means we analyze computers. Digital forensics means we analyze any item, any digital item, cell phone, printer, fax, SD cards. And then monitoring activities. We need to monitor our progress. What's the good of implementing something and not keeping up to date? So it's critical to um, provide insight to management on what is going on with what we've implemented. And the key here, ladies and gents, is to focus on effectiveness, meaning to measure outcomes instead of outputs. What we found in many organizations is an over-reliance on process metrics instead of impact. So 150 employees attended the, the fraud awareness training. So what? Are we seeing behavior changes? Do, can people recite the values? Are they living the values? Are, we, are they reporting more fraud? Yes, they are. Well, then the, the training worked. If they're not, then the training hasn't worked. So it's one thing to monitor, but we need to actually explain to other people so that they understand what's been going on in terms of what we've done and what we found in the fraud risk assessments, the data analytics. So I wanna show you an example from a dashboard from a friend of mine, Ron Warmington, he used to be the chief audit executive at General Electric Money, the bank of GE. In year one, he, he was his exposure to fraud was $150 million, of which he prevented and detected 108 million, the green, recovered 10 million, the yellow, and lost 31 million. His cost to the business is 4.4 million, right at the bottom. That's his salaries and data analytics, anything that he buys. Return on investment, 27 to one. It's the prevented and detected, added to the recoveries, divided by his cost. The CFO is happy with him. He's getting a return on investment. So look at the next year. Look at the bottom right-hand corner. His budget has doubled to $10 million. The CFO said, I'm very happy with you. Most... Audit departments are cost centers. You're a profit center for me. Please keep it up. In year two, his exposure doubled, 334 million, of which he prevented and detected most of it, recovered 10 million of the losses, and lost 42 million. ROI, 29 to 1. Ladies and gents, that's a high-level overview of the 60 pages in the playbook. So there is the URL where you can go and download the playbook. And on the right-hand side, you've got supplemental fraud risk tools. The, the last two are Excel spreadsheets that you can download and populate. It's a risk assessment and follow-up action template and a point of focus document. And the first two are online tools. Interactive scorecard, there it is, where you can look at all five principles and rate yourself. Control self-assessment. Am I red, amber, or green for each of 
those elements of the five principles. This would take you about an hour or two to do. It's comprehensive. And then we've got the library of anti-fraud data analytics. Many organizations have got data analytics software, but they don't know what scripts to write and what must I look for? So there you've got your three categories, corruption, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud, and with the drop-down boxes. So if we want to look at conflicts of interest, and in particular purchasing schemes, click on it, it drops down, and there are all the tests we can run depending on our business. Are there any questions or comments? Ladies and gents, if you followed the chat, um, we are, I've included links to the content that we spoke about today. My last link speaks to the tools, uh, the, 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 the last two or three slides that Mario has covered. Thank you. Okay, let us check. Thank you for that, Antonio. I hope they can access the, they're able to access the links from the chat. If not, we will be sending you the booklets for you to distribute. Do you have any questions? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. That will be helpful as well. Okay, I think there's a comment from Elizabeth insightful presentation in terms of fraud risk assessment. Just want to know what can be done as an internal auditor if the organizational system allows for disclosure of information, such as when requesting for transport, you have to disclose where you are going, what you are going to do and for how long, then that is when you can be allocated a vehicle. I don't really understand Elizabeth's question. Antonia, do you maybe? I think uh, Elizabeth, if they... Sorry, I think it relates to the level of transparency or the degree to which internal audit may be transparent about the activities, uh, and especially when the risk of that transparency, uh, you know, relates to uh, perhaps uh, informing the next party of um, I'm doing an investigation or I'm auditing you. And if I understand that correctly, it's indicative of an environment where the governance around fraud risk management hasn't been established because some leeway needs to be available to protect or create an anonymity. Sometimes you're doing surprise forensic audits and in such an environment where a different process is not provided for you to do that, it becomes very difficult. Let me give you a practical example of how we see that even as consultants is that uh, in a typical uh, uh, situation, scenario, we, we would do an investigation and then the client would say, I want a detailed breakdown of an invoice, meaning disclose to me where you went. And it's a similar situation to what's described. Where did you go? Who did you interview? How many hours did it take? So, so if you're working in an environment where they understand and they've got a fraud uh, uh, governance structure, th that will not happen. You know, generally, they would say, create an invoice and say consulting services but on a separate document, detail your activities. And that document doesn't go to finance. It perhaps goes back to the fraud risk committee or, or some committee under the governance structure. So in short, you would need to establish, um, beginning with the first principle, the governance around the fraud risk management within your organization. And not that you don't want to be transparent or disclose your activities, but they should be such that it's pro that information is protected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a few comments. Fraud is a very interesting subject, especially under procurement and contract management. Well done to the presenters. Very informative. Um, there's another question from Maria. Is it advisable to place fraud investigation in the internal audit or risk management unit? Most organizations, from my experience, place it under internal audit. It's more appropriate there. Some, one organization had it under security, not appropriate at all. It needs to be where it, it is best understood. And I think it's internal audit. Thank you for that, Maria. 
There's another question from Zane. Very insightful presentation. Doing fraud risk assessment, is it fundamentally different from doing a normal risk? It depends on the person doing the assessment. If, if the risk manager understands fraud and the fraudster mindset, it, it, he can do it in the same assessment. Um, one of our clients asked us to come in and forensics sat under internal audit and they wanted to do fraud risk assessments. And the risk department said, we want to do it. We are risk. And they asked me to come in and explain to them what a fraud risk assess assessment entails, which I did. And the risk department said, we didn't know half the stuff. You're quite right. It belongs under internal audit. So that's why I'm not saying all risk departments don't understand fraud, but many of them don't. Some of them do. If I may add to what Mario is saying, you know, fraud is a specialized area. And, 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 and you, when you look at the 2013 COSO with those 17 principles, it's very strong or places emphasis on the very idea that fraud requires specialist skills. So, so Tawani, Tawani, yes, you know, while, as Mario says, you know, it, it, there are similarities, but it depends on the person doing it. If the person doing it is a specialist in matters relating to fraud, then by all means. Otherwise, you can't take uh, uh, an ordinary risk or even internal audit person who's not exposed to fraud, um, where the levels of competence, as we've discussed, under the rules of, you know, uh, um, conduct, uh, you know, discussed by, I think it was James that discussed it. It's very specialized. So we need to make sure we, we the, the person doing it understands it. Um, and then by all means, they can follow the normal procedures around uh, risk assessment. Uh, could I make one comment? Yes, please. I, I understand what Elizabeth's saying now. And... Elizabeth, uh, one of my friends is a CAE at one of the car hire companies. And she tells me what she does. She says, I will tell the Cape Town office I'm coming to do an audit next week. At the last minute, I change my mind. And I go to Bloemfontein instead. I get off the plane. Nobody knows I'm there. I then call the, br the branch and I say, come send the driver to collect me, please. And I say, but your company owns a hire car company. You could get one for free at the airport. She says, no, I want him to drive me. And in the 20 minutes or half an hour he's driving me, I'm pumping him for information. So by the time I get to the dealership, I basically know what's going on there. I arrive, I'm surprising them, and I do my audit. She says, you know how much I find. But many organizations, the internal auditors are not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to do surprise audits. But she's a very effective auditor because... Her CEO stands behind her and says, you're welcome to do that. You can tell Cape Town you're coming, but then go to Durban instead or go to Khabarani instead. So thanks for your question, Elizabeth. Thank you, Marianne. Molanto, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for that comment. Okay. There's an additional question from Kumo. In Botswana, in the public sector, we hear of so much fraud activity, especially in procurement, misappropriation, kickbacks, embezzlement, et cetera. But the fraud management skill gap is quite wide with a lot of fraud practitioners found in the private sector and not the public sector. And there are no fraud roles or designations or positions in most public sector setups. Who should be looking to close this gap in the public sector? And how can HR solution and is the public sector fraud skill gap similar in SA? Let me, let me briefly comment on that and I'll, I'll hand over to Mario for further thoughts. Uh, this is not a challenge that Botswana on its own experiences. Many, many jurisdictions suffer the same fate where you might find experience investigators first started in the public sector in law enforcement and so forth and private sector then took them because it can afford them and they bring their specialist understanding of whatever public sector environment it is it could be the tax authority and so forth and and the the, the sad part is once these expertise are, are taken into the private sector they are then developed further and, and public sector can never afford them and so you have this gap that's been described 
Um, the reality is, colleagues, the, the way around this is the partnership between private and public sector. The, the, there's that social duty to um, uh, where, where we need to go beyond profits. Um, otherwise, we're going to find our, our government agencies uh, basically helpless. Mario, your thoughts? Thanks, Antonio. Yeah, and, and um, to skill up and become a CFE, ladies and gents, certified fraud examiner, that would be the starting point. Um, Antonio is as an authorized trainer for the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. He went to America to, to do the training. And that would be step one. Then you can decide the area of specialty from there onwards. So the first step, join the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners if you want to know more about fraud and specialize in that. You know, it's great to be a CIA. Some of the most effective auditors are CIAs and CFEs. Okay, thank you both. Um, so there's another question. What techniques should be used to detect fraudulent acts done through collusion? Maria, I like that question. Who does it come from? Uh, Lisedi, this Lisedi. is when I say, please, please go and read our playbook and uh, then we can engage. But um, we do share many practical things. You know, when you unpack collusion, uh, at much as the ex exercise we first gave you in the art gallery, so many things can go wrong. So there's so much of the collusion element that we need to unpack. Unlike a traditional procurement audit, there isn't one way of looking at collusion. Um, so understanding the root cause, the scenario itself, uh, will then lead you to the, the various uh, um, uh, um, avenues that, that one could use, or tactics as you call it to detect fraudulent acts done through collusions. But the basics, the basics are in the, in the playbook and, and I do encourage you to play around there. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. There's two more. I think one is how should the internal auditor and the fraud investigator complement each other? And then the other one I think relates to the earlier response. Is the idea to catch your client off guard or to collaborate with the corporates to try find a solution to the gaps in the internal control of fraud detecting tools? Um, I can answer, Abia. It's not to catch the client off guard. Um, there's always going to be fraud. We want to collaborate with the corporates. But, Abia, there's so much fraud out there. How are we going to catch the fraudsters if, we, if we're telling them when we're coming? Because then they're going to start, they'll be on their best behavior. That's why it's called a surprise audit. We do it on an ad hoc basis when something like data analytics or fraud risk assessment justifies to us that something could be wrong there. But yes, we want to collaborate. But remember, the fraudster does not want to collaborate with us. And many times management are the fraudsters. Look at Steinhoff. Look at, look at Tonga Hewlett. Thank you. Thank you. And that me. one from Zaune, how should the internal all the time? Okay, Mario, um, there's that. Other one, how should internal auditors and fraud investigators complement each other? Are we audible? Uh, uh. Yes, they com they complement each other. And as Antonia said earlier, um, many internal auditors don't have the fraud knowledge. And that's why I made the comment saying some of the best auditors that we have worked with are both CIAs and CFEs. It's the same with the risk manager. A member of IRMSA, for example, they don't necessarily understand fraud. If they become a CFE, now they become a very good risk manager because they understand the missing element, which is fraud risk management. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll take, I think there's one last comment from Tulufela Bohosi. Surprise audits to me are not progressive in our profession. They will drive the perception that we are policing. I believe the way you design your tests should still show you, should still show you red flags. 
I am in total agreement with you that competence is key. And thank you for an insightful presentation. Okay, then I'll take, okay, this is the very last one. <laughs> How do you deal with sourcing information from outside clients when you establish in your investigation that there's a collusion and you as an internal auditor, you are not allowed to access outside information unless you are a law enforcement officer or have a such warrant? How do you deal with that? Antonio? Yeah, I think, is it Hilda? Hilda has already answered herself in, in that. You are not authorized uh, to deal with that outside information. It, it, it falls within the ambit of a criminal procedure act, therefore requires a search warrant or a legal instrument to allow for access to that information. We're seeing a move globally towards protection of what is called personally identifiable information. We're seeing a, a development of privacy regulations around the world to limit this very thing of unauthorized access to uh, this person identifying for identifiable information. So uh, certainly, uh, as an internal auditor, you may need this information. Uh, there is no shortcut. Uh, we don't subscribe to unauthorized or illegal means. Um, and therefore, you simply have no way other than to follow due process and work with law enforcement, obtain the relevant search warrants if it's a criminal procedure. If it's a civil procedure, again, you do have avenues, uh, mandamus that you can pursue, uh, Anton Pillar orders, and other uh, search um, instruments that are available under the, 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 the rules of civil procedure. So uh, th there's no short way around it. Uh, you need to follow due process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Antonio and Mario. I believe that, uh, that brings us to the end of um, your presentation and we will quickly take vote of thanks before we close before we close uh, the session thank you very much for a wonderful presentation mario you can send the the documents through and we'll share them with the participants we'll do is that tracy yes okay thanks tracy all right thank you very much um, at this juncture, I've also been asked to give the those that don't know me. So my name is Tracy Dipaho. I'm also with my co-facilitator, Me Maria Mokwati. So I'll also just quickly turn it off because we are having um, a connection problem. So it has been a wonderful.